Hi, I'm Kian O'Carroll, and back in 2018, I met Vicky Phelan when she was looking for a solicitor to help her fight her case. She went on to win that case and uncovered a shocking healthcare scandal that has affected so many women and families across Ireland. We also became friends. Vicky went on to fight one campaign after another for women's healthcare in Ireland, and all the time fighting for her own life, fighting for more time. This is a series of conversations where Vicky and I discuss what went wrong in cervical check, how those fatal and life-changing mistakes happened, and look at what Vicky has achieved since she became an advocate for change. Hello again, I'm Kian O'Carroll and once again I'm in conversation with Vicky Phelan. Now what's different, hello Vicky. Hi Kian, how are you? Great, thank you. What's different this time is that uh, while we're still separated with uh, <laughs> remote calls and video calls and the like, you're now on the other side of the Atlantic. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And five hours behind, so it's all very... And Different. five hours behind. So you just got up and mm. I've just had my lunch. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, and for the, the real timeline in all of this, it is, uh, it is Ash Wednesday here in Ireland. Oh, yes. I'm okay. sure it's Ash so Wednesday I'm totally in America. Removed. <laughs> I'm sure it is, but I don't know what anybody know over here, you know. I do remember some years ago uh, listening to a radio interview on Morning Ireland or something, and this American contributor called in. And in, in the course of the interview, it was mentioned to him that today was Good Friday, to which he said, right, and a happy Good Friday to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not how we approach it here. But in any event, you're now in... Uh, Maryland, you're on the mm -hmm. edges of the uh, hospital, the, the mega hospital complex of Bethesda. And um, yeah. when we last spoke, you were describing the decision making process around going to the States and, and how it was uh, a necessary and essential decision in order to progress uh, mm. your, your health care. Um, since then, you found out just how necessary that was. Yeah, I have. Um, so when I um, decided to come over here, it was based on scans that I'd had in September um, at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital and things looked like they were uh, increasing. So we did biopsies actually of two lymph nodes just to confirm that it was indeed, you know, tumor growth and not just inflammation, because sometimes the immunotherapy drugs can inflame lymph nodes and make it look like there's growth. And that has happened to me in the past. But this was, you know, true uh, tumor growth. And then there was also the, um, you know, the evidence of a new tumor. So I have a new tumor in my lung, but it's quite small. Uh, so at that stage, yeah, I remember speaking to the doctor on the trial over here, um, you know, about a year ago, uh, a year prior to kind of when I started on this trial. And he said, you know, the time to move would be when I have new tumors. Um, so I contacted him at that stage. Uh, that was back in, you know, October and uh, to get the ball rolling. And uh, yeah, I mean, because I'd applied already before to another trial, they had a lot of my paperwork. So all they needed was new imaging scans and kind of an up-to-date physician report on my condition. Um, so, you know, they would actually have happily accepted me before Christmas if I wanted to come over. But no, mm. I decided, you know, I wanted to have my last um, Christmas at home really before um, I came over here because, you know, I suppose I didn't really know what way this was going to go. I mean, that's unfortunately the position I'm in, that if I had come before Christmas, yes, it would have been nice to get started sooner. But, you know, what if it's my last Christmas? There are other things you have to ask yourself, I suppose, in my situation. So um, when I came over, obviously, the first thing they did was, you know, uh, organize a raft of tests and scans. Uh, I was in for a full two days. Literally, I think every scan and test known to men was done. Um, and the results of that scan showed that there had actually been more growth since the scan in September. So mm. um, the three tumours that had already increased had increased again. They'd almost doubled in size. Um, and I had two new tumours up here on my supraclavicular nodes. Mm. You, you had expected progression, um, presumably. You had expected things to be a little bit further along. Uh, were you mm. um, surprised by the... Uh, the amount by which things had progressed? Yeah, I was in such a short space of time, I suppose, because the last scan had been only in September and this was January, you know, I mean, space of three months, you know, three of yeah. the tumours had doubled in size, I suppose, you know, 
Of course, I that is 90 quite, days. I'm, Hmm? Yeah, yeah. But I suppose the fact that I time. hadn't, yeah, I didn't feel any worse though. And that's, that's the, you know, which is great. You know, I didn't feel any different. I didn't have any new symptoms. Um, so it kind of felt a bit strange to think that things had grown, even though I didn't feel any different. Um, and then two more new lymph nodes appeared um, mm. in my, you know, literally up here in my supraclavicular. Um, in a in new location. Blade. Yeah, yeah, a new location. Yeah. So... So it was definitely the time to make the move, you know. Great. Mm. And now you've had, what, two treatments? I've had two treatments, yeah. Yeah, so um, this trial involves three drugs. Uh, mm. So the main drug is uh, the immunotherapy drug, M7824. Um, normally, you would give that in conjunction with the other two drugs. Uh, but I only had two of the three drugs the first uh, day that I had treatment because they were worried about the, <coughs> excuse me, the immunotherapy drug, because I'd had so much brachytherapy and a lot of external beam radiation to my pelvis, um, what they have found, I think, on this trial is that other patients who've had brachytherapy in particular are much more prone to bleeding. Um, so that's one of the big side effects with this drug, with this new immunotherapy drug, is bleeding. Um, so it's bladder um, damage, really, you know. Uh, and they wanted to give me a lower dose, uh, but they hadn't got approval at that stage, so they kind of held off on giving it to me until the second um treatment uh, so I had it last week um, but on its own so basically what I'll have is every second week I'll have three drugs and the other you know every second week then in between that I'll have one the main drug um, so it'll be three drugs one treatment and then two weeks later one and then two weeks later three again so it's kind of an unusual um, cycle the way they operated but that's that's obviously what they found that works and how far down the road is that planned now at this stage? How how far do you see? I see all the way to February 2022. It literally is my last scheduled treatment date. Um, okay. And I think everybody at home was a bit shocked at that. I mean, I knew um, coming over here that it was for a year, but mm. I told everybody it was six months because mm. I just thought preparing them for you know six months was easier than preparing them for a year. Um, but I knew once I got the treatment schedule that you know I'd have to kind of tell them that this was for a longer period but in fairness to my uh, doctor who's treating me here you know he understands that I'm away from my family and my children um, and you know he's already said to me that you know if this works really well and he's had instances where it has you know after six months he could look at um, tapering off the the treatment schedule and that maybe I'm you know if, if I'm responding really well at that stage that I might only have to come over every three months so I would be yeah. able to go home but we'll see you know we'll see and forgive me now if this sounds a bit negative but is there anything then which would derail the treatment and bring it to an end so i have a scan um on the 23rd of march um so every eight weeks you get scanned and basically my first scan after being on this for eight weeks is is at the end of march and basically at that point if things aren't improving if there's no shrinkage in any of my tumors and obviously if there's more tumors developing you know that that's it basically you know that's curtains closed it's very clinical you know i'll be taken off the the, the regime because you know yeah. obviously it's not working because they know um already from previous uh, patients who've been on this trial that you know generally they would see uh, a reaction um after eight weeks so if there's no reaction after eight weeks that's it you know so i'm already looking at other trials here because my logic is that you know if this doesn't work i need to stay here um, and find another trial to get on because I'm here now. Uh, there's nothing to go back to at home, treatment-wise. So I'll have to try and find something else to keep me. Not getting rid of you. No, <laughs> no. Um, so the eighth of March, you said, is 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 an important date there. Uh, no, the twenty third. Twenty third. I'm sorry, twenty third of March. Eight eight weeks. Eight weeks after yes. treatment starts. Yeah. Uh, mm. But you have. Which is my mother's well. birthday, by the way, and I think that's a good omen. Well, I hope so. Anyway, you know. Has to be a good sign. Yeah. You have to give her a good present. Have to give her a good present, exactly. Um, and of course, you have responded well so far to immunotherapy drugs, so. Mm, yeah, and that's the logic, you know, um, of my doctor as well. You know, the fact that I've responded so well to Pembro, he thinks I should respond well to this. Um, I suppose the problems with the responding to the drug is how am I going to tolerate it? And I've already had, you know, a couple of reactions um, so hopefully that will ease off. I've had a fairly couple of very rough days of, you know, being sick. Um, and I've been sick before. I've been sick on Pembroke quite a bit, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. I probably would have had 
one day, as you know, every two or three weeks where I literally have to take to the bed and I'm vomiting all day long. Um, so it's not like I'm not used to getting sick. I am. But this was different. It was more sustained um, and I couldn't hold anything down. I couldn't even drink a sip of water. So it was I was getting dehydrated very quickly. So I had to go into the hospital to get uh, fluids to rehydrate me. And um, and we've adjusted my medication. So uh, the anti-sickness tablets that they had put me on were oral. But the problem was by the time they got to my stomach, I was puking already. So they weren't getting to my stomach to work. So now they've given me ones that act fast kind of on the tongue. So they dissolve on the tongue, go into your bloodstream that way. And at least that way, you know, they seem to be on the job. So hopefully, you know, it's, it's like everything. It's a trial and error, you know, with a lot of this stuff. Well, by the time these conversations are uh, are watched by anyone, um, that will be old news. My uh, Madeline, yeah. my, my wife was telling me at lunch that uh, that there's another daily update on how Vicky's getting on in the Irish Independent. <laughs> Uh, and um so uh, so yeah it is literally at the stage of people are you know the nation is keeping an eye on the covid mm. situation on a daily basis and then the regular updates as to how vicky's getting on in the states i know um, it's 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 been phenomenal to be quite honest i mean you know keen you've mm. been with me walked this path with me for the past almost three years now at this stage and you know what it's been like for me with people contacting me but this is this is this is well, at a, this is at a level i've i've never i've never so, had the amount of contact honestly to be quite honest yeah we're walking walking a footpath with you but everyone walking <laughs> their path um, walking a footpath with you in a public place um, was extraordinary and it certainly took an awfully long time to get from one end of a street in dublin to the other mm. um but uh but it is magical to see how like it's all such positive stuff nobody is imagine if imagine if that was your experience and you were a disgraced banker who people were hurling abuse at yeah yeah oh um, look uh, that would be extraordinary i mean i i saw that down at the forecourts last year there was a mm. a, a well-known uh, pariah um and i'm not judging the man when i call him a pariah but he was you know somebody who had been cast down into the lower pits of um, a public appreciation and just in a matter of 60 seconds I saw two different groups hurling abuse at him as he walked down the street wow. and, okay. uh, and a very very wealthy man who was protected from all of that and probably wouldn't experience it normally and it's shocking to see but anyway that's getting away from the point when you walk down the street it's a very different thing um, and now is, these, yeah. these emails that you have uh, invited upon yourself yeah um so when I had appeared on the Late Late Show with Ryan Tuberty, um, his show obviously had been contacted after you know that that appearance because I was on the show on the Friday and literally flying out on Sunday, and uh, people flooded the show literally kind of how can we contact Vicky when she's away in America you know is there an address, and um, you know Ryan's idea was he said well Jesus you know I, I don't think we should give him your address Vicky, um, for lots of reasons I mean for me I think I'd have I'd have really pissed off my postman over here. But also, um, you know, just from, oh, from you the couldn't. security point of view, no, couldn't, couldn't, no. <laughs> so he said, you know, would you consider setting up an email address? And I actually had had to set up a new, a brand new email address anyway for my new MacBook, which I wasn't using for anything but, you know, the MacBook. So I thought, well, you know, I have a new email address and I'm not really using. Um, yeah, sure. Look, that's probably the easiest way around this. But um, I've had three and a half thousand emails in the last whatever, you know, month, five weeks. So, and, you know, I'm trying, obviously I can't reply to all of them. It's just impossible, yeah. but I'm trying, I'm reading them all um, as much as I can. And I'm getting some lovely emails. You know, there's just some lovely stuff in there and people sending me, there's this one man who just sends me pictures from his house, you know, and the crocuses are growing today and a little bit more uh, sign of life. It just lovely stuff, you know, uh, that would just, sure. How would you not feel good about yourself when you get well, that's nice messages beautiful. like and, that? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I thought of that man and your story about him uh, yesterday. Yesterday was my mm. first experience of spring here in Ireland. Uh, there was a bit of warmth in the air, the beautiful sunshine. And I was coming back in from a run and the crocuses under a tree in our front garden were uh, out in huge numbers. And I took a couple of pictures to send you on. Well, there we uh, go. As... Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, on top of uh, the lovely John who sends me um, pictures from his garden in, in Wexford, you know, I have another man who um, just decided to, uh, to contact me and cheer me up and send me music recommendations. So, you know, twice a week he sends me a song 
to listen to and tells me what it means to him and that, uh, you know, it might just cheer me up or, um, you know, to get me listening to other types of music. So, you know, and then there's another lady called Daphne who sends me a link to the morning prayer every day of the week. I get that every day of the week. So from whatever mass she goes to, she uploads the link to to, to the morning prayer from, from that day's mass. So, you know, for, there's just so many different you know, people who are doing it on a regular basis, and then the, yeah. the you know people who just contact me once off. But they're just lovely, you know. It's it's it's, it's Any lovely to think. songs that uh, that struck you? Um, there was one from um, oh jeez, I can't think of it now that I hadn't heard before. Um, oh jeez, I can't. Sorry, no, I can't think of it. Oh, uh, no, I can't think of it. The, on the yeah, spot. you're catching me on the. And hop, any ones, yeah. any ones that you had heard before? Uh, no, none of them. None of the songs he's recommended have I heard before. So okay. yeah, that's always nice, I think. You know, it's always oh, yeah. nice to hear other music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And style then? Are we talking gospel, oh, country, ma- like, rock? W- very widely, uh, you know, different. So from Simon and Garfunkel, that was one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a song I hadn't heard before, Paul Simon, that was another one, um, uh, to kind of country music. So it's, a, it's very kind of varied, but uh, yeah. I've listened to three of them, you know, not all of them. I'm up to about three at this stage. But, you know, it's always nice to listen to other other music, I think, anyway, uh, because you wouldn't, you know, especially when somebody tells you what it means to them and, and where they heard it first. Or, it's just a nice idea, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, I think. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's all part of the same thing, isn't it? It's people trying to reach out beyond themselves to, to give mm. you something, to give you yeah. their encouragement, their good wishes, even their love. Yeah, yeah. Which and is, even uh, like, you know, the the way they write the emails, a lot of it is very um, as if they knew me, you know, like, hmm. well, sure, I'm here now and I'm putting on the dinner and it's raining outside and you wouldn't believe what kind of a day it is over here or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just lovely. Really, really would, you know, how could you not feel good about yourself? So, I mean, I would read a good few of those every day, um, particularly if I'm having, you know, a bad day or, you know, which I had last week. They're the type of things, apart from obviously talking to my children, yeah. um, but when I can't talk to them and they're in bed, you know, because I'm five hours behind, because once it hits maybe six, seven o'clock in the evening here, I'm pretty much on my own, you know, because everybody at mm. home has gone to bed. So that's when I find these are really come into their own, I suppose, for me, you know, they definitely help. Mm. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, your evenings are a bit more yeah. isolated from Ireland, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's an odd person who would be up now. My brother's over in New Zealand, so I do get, you know, sometimes I would talk to him um, to fill in that gap at times. But uh, yeah, from kind of seven o'clock, really, I mean, that's midnight at home. So, you know, most people, okay. particularly during the week, are going to bed. So, um, and the I basic practicalities myself. then, are you, are you feeding yourself properly? Yeah, I am. I mean, look, I have a fridge freezer full of food. Um, I, I don't know if I said this. To you. No, I didn't, sure. Um, so since I've arrived, I've had all of these Irish people living here in America who, who have landed and literally filled my freezer with food, who have, you know, beef stews to um, chicken pot pies, you know, so very Irish stuff to very American stuff. Um, and literally, I have a freezer full of soups and stews to keep me going now, I'd say for about three or four months, you know, so I, I don't <laughs> think I'll have to cook myself for quite a while, you know. <laughs> and it's all delicious stuff, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so far, mm. you know, it's great. What's a chicken pot pie? So chicken pot pie is like a pastry uh, pie. So on both uh, underneath and on top. And then it's chicken and kind of a creamy sauce with peas. And yeah, it's quite nice, actually. Okay. So that would be very typical over here, chicken pot pie. And that's what people would eat when they're sick. You know, those, those kind of homemade yeah. uh, type of things. And I've met a lovely uh, Jewish woman over here uh, through one of my Irish friends. And she made me, which is uh, one of my friends is really into food. And she said, oh, my God, I can't believe you got chicken matzo ball soup. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's the kind of uh, they call it uh, the penicillin uh, for Jewish people that it's such a good soup um, to have when you're sick. So I've, uh, you know, a load of that in my freezer. So, I mean, you know, I, I can't go wrong here. <laughs> Great. So you've got plenty of ethnic variety across your across your freezer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, one of the things I was struck by um, that you were saying about the differences, uh, probably mm. the most significant difference between the healthcare you've experienced over there and in Ireland. I'm, I'm sure there are other ones too, but you were saying about medical records. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, that was the one that really has blown me away, I think, to be quite honest. So literally the first week I got here, I had to go into admissions and fill out a load of paperwork and consent forms. But one of the things I had to fill out a form for was to get access to the online portal. Um, and it's called Follow My Health. And I, of course, I didn't really know what I was signing up for. I just signed whatever I was told to sign. Um, and next thing, they sent me a, a link to get into it. And I logged in and realized, actually, this is all my, you know, all my records. Um, so I'd had uh, the, all the blood tests and scans the week before I got access to this uh, uh, portal. So when I went in, logged in, here were all the results of all my blood tests. Here was the result of my um, CT scan with a full report, mm. you know, just there for me to access anytime I want. Download, you can, you know, you can download these files. You know, it's not like they're, you know, you know, just there to be viewed. You can actually download them as PDFs, obviously, you know, so you can't doctor them. But um, I couldn't believe this, that, you know, for something at home, for me to get access to records like that at home, I have to put in, as you know, either a request through my doctor or an FOI request, which can take weeks. So uh, for me, this has just been one of the best things, you know, to see that I can get access to all of this information. And literally within, you know, 24 to 48 hours, depending on how fast they get the results back. Now, I know it might not be the same everywhere, that this may be unique to the NIH because of the type of hospital it is, in that the speed of the results, uh, I think they're very fast here. And that might not be the case for everywhere, but I definitely know from talking to other Americans, because I have asked, because I was curious, um, mm. that this would be quite uh, the norm, that people, patients over here, have access to their records uh, like this in an online portal. I mean, it's phenomenal. Um. Yeah, it, it certainly wouldn't be the case here, and it's medical records are treated as something of a. Well, I think there are two differences in what you're describing. You're saying that in the first place, you have immediate, open, um, and sincerely open access to your own medical records. So that must feel um, comforting that you're not missing out on anything, particularly where you're involved in your healthcare. But I think you were saying as well that the way technical re results and reports and the like are written is also bearing that in mind that the patient will be reading it that it's in an accessible form yeah absolutely i mean that's the thing i found most striking really was when i was reading the report on my scan that it was mm. written with full sentences it wasn't just you know gobbledygook really you know all words yeah. um it was full sentences and it went through the scan literally from you know from here down so it kind of explained exactly what was seen on the scan all the way down for, from the top of my body to, to the bottom um, and what it found at each location and what size each tumor was and the measurement you know mm. it was it was and it was it was very easily you know very much very easy to read you know I couldn't believe it whereas when I get reports on my scans at home I'd mm. understand it but it was all very you know you knew it was written with the from you know a radiographer to a doctor in mind not the patient yes yes, yes. you know that's and that's the difference that, that's much more than a technical thing so you can see how obviously certain hospitals in ireland um the the, the high-tech hospitals and others now are moving towards electronic records mm. um, which by the way i'm having great difficulty in piecing together and reading because when they're printed out they're not printed out in the way that paper records had a certain chronology and, and kind of a narrative to them as you went through the story. But that's a separate point. Um, but you can see how the technology could easily be implemented, that you would have portals where patients would log in. But to change the, the, the communication style of the doctors and the uh, laboratory specialists, that would mm. probably be a much more challenging thing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but definitely. It has to start. I think so. Yeah, hmm. definitely. I, I think, you know, it's 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 been great because actually, you know, um, I mean, I didn't even get the results from my doctor. I was just able to access it myself. So, you know, hmm. once I got the report, then I was able to ask questions at the next appointment, which was great, you know, to be hmm. able to to ask those questions um, and to have access to that information. So, yeah, no, I, I have to say it's just been so far. And you know what I'm like? I like to have access to all this information. Um, so it's been great for me to be able to see that. And I'm also tracking, say, looking at my blood tests. So they're doing an awful lot of blood tests over here um, that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily do at home, like the CA125 levels. Low. So so they're, you know, levels of cancer uh, that they would yes. often see in your blood. So mine were mm. quite high at the start. So they are tracking that to see will it come down, you know, so it was in the 300s. Um, so hopefully, you know, that that's one thing that they are kind of measuring. Um, and okay. they've told me that they're measuring that to see, you know, will that come down the levels? 
um, and that would be one good sign that this is working as well. So, you know, and, and they've all of the different blood um, tests broken down and what they're for. So, you know, even for somebody like me, I, I know what some of them are for, but I didn't know what all of them are for. But there's an explanation beside it as to what that's measuring, you know. So, it's, yeah. yeah, it's fascinating, you know. I could Excellent. Spend hours. Now, I should say, it, um, if I were a doctor watching this, I'd probably say, well, you know, I don't see solicitors um, giving their clients open access to their files on a, on a live viewing basis. Um, I do seem to remember there was a product that was trialled several years back which would allow that um, mm. but I suspect it wasn't that popular um, because ultimately it is quite a burden that you're putting on yourself that every letter when it comes in will be responded to you know very quickly and that no loose threads will exist um, and I, I can only say in, in, in all honesty that our system in legal practice is probably a lot more forgiving of uh, minor delays and difficulties like that than for example uh, a medical system will be where obviously a test result has a very very significant and important meaning and needs to be acted upon quickly so mm. the, the, you're, you're not really comparing apples but I, I I am a little bit in awe since you told me about this um, that, mm. that that such a system would be widespread acro across uh, a healthcare system mm. yeah, yeah that's, that's so I'm told now again is that the case for everybody, you know, so people that don't have, you know, good health insurance, would they have access to that? That's what I don't know. You know, I'm assuming from what I've been told by friends who live here that that is the case for everybody. But anyone I've spoken to all have health insurance. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that may not be the case for people who don't, but I, I couldn't imagine that they'd discriminate either. I mean, I would imagine those people would be entitled to access to their records as well. But, mm. you know, it's not it's not something I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I think as you go down the socioeconomic mm. uh, spectrum in the US uh, and, you know, socioeconomics have a bearing on healthcare and access to healthcare and quality of care in Ireland as well. There's no point in us, yeah. you know, pretending otherwise. Um, and certainly private patients in Ireland tend to be operated on by the uh, experienced consultant rather than by the less experienced and training registrar or whatever these things are common features of the types of things that we work on here um, but in the states i think it's certainly the case that as you go down that um, ladder uh, you find it increasingly hard to access any health care mm. and it would be very unlikely i would have thought that you would find high or uh, um, high tech uh, information technology being made available to patients who themselves uh, find it hard even to access a doctor yeah yeah so yeah but that's um you are at a not just a national but a world center of excellence yes um for cancer treatment and so it is understandable that we would see a little bit like formula one you know you're in yeah. you're in the you're in 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 the ferrari garage and um and so you're seeing the the very latest of uh of of ideas being implemented and yeah and i'm delighted that you are there yeah i mean even the way they you know the the the, the speed of the response so even when i rang my doctor um on sunday morning and i mean this was a sunday morning you know at the end of the day on a weekend to say that I was, you know, really, really ill and I hadn't been able to keep anything down for, you know, well over 24 hours, you know, straight away he said, well, you know, we'll, 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 I think the best thing now at this stage is to bring you in and, you know, get you on an IV fluid um, drip um, at the hospital. He said, just give me five minutes. And, you know, he rang me back and said, yes, there's a bed available for you on the day ward, you know. So you can see straight away, you know, that it's, uh, you know, a different, definitely a different level of care, you know, it's... Well Go back a step and, and, and explain to us then how that comes about. So you check into the hospital. He's your doctor. Is he the equivalent of the consultant managing your care in Ireland? Yeah, except he's not. I mean, he is an oncologist, but he's more a researcher than an oncologist. So he's mm -hmm. the principal investigator. That's what he's called, the principal investigator on the trial. So he's the doctor that's in charge of the trial. But he's a qualified doctor at the end of the day. Um, and he would make all the decisions regarding trial patients and uh, you know, I do have a research nurse that I can call as well. But he did um, say to me after I had the treatment on Tuesday that if I had any problems to call him um, because he makes the decisions at the end of the day. You know, if I went to her, she'd still have to go to him. So um, I rang him. I have his mobile number, rang him. And, uh, you know, he rang the hospital and straight away had me booked in 
uh, to get fluids that day and to get a new prescription for uh, an antisynthesis tablet that wouldn't that would dissolve my tongue so because that was the problem I wasn't getting the tablet quick enough to for it to work um so I was you know vomiting straight back up basically so um I still haven't met him I mean this is the whole thing with covid it's interesting I've only seen him on a zoom call <laughs> Um, you know, so he's in a different part of the building. So every time I go in for my clinic appointment, I meet my nurse. Um, but you know, she brings in a phone or a laptop, and we talk on the on this on the screen. So I still haven't met him. I'm sure I will at some stage, but with COVID at the moment, um, no, we have not yet met. So it's 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 an interesting kind of time to be a patient. You know, when you're not meeting a doctor. It is, but it's a small disadvantage when you can get him on the mobile phone on a Sunday morning. Exactly. So that's the difference, you know, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. impressive access. And do you yeah. know if that's because you're on a trial? I know, obviously, you wouldn't have a principal investigator if you weren't on a trial. But do you know if, for example, you were in mainstream treatment, would you have access out of hours as such to uh, somebody managing your care like that? I'm not I don't know, to be quite honest, but I, no. I, I wouldn't imagine so. I wouldn't imagine you get that level of access. I think, you know, the thing with trial patients is they want to make sure that, you know, they keep you. I mean, I suppose, you know, he said to me when he accepted me on the trial that he knew, you know, he, he, he thinks I'll be a good candidate. So, you know, they want to mind their good candidates, I suppose, and make sure that, you know, I can stay on the drugs because what he doesn't want to see happening, I suppose, is that I have to come off them because that's going to yeah. skew his results so anything that he can do and his team i suppose to keep me um mm. on them you know well that's better for him you know with with the outcomes i suppose yeah. that he's looking for yeah and so, it's not i that mean he it's wants... great it's great peace mm. of mind for me as well to know that i can call him or the nurse and you know they will deal with it if i'm having any terrible side effect particularly because i'm here on my own you know that is a comfort for me to know that so wishing you well from myself as well as it seems everybody else who's ever heard of you here in Ireland and that is presumably everybody um, and we will be talking again pretty soon so in the next episode we're going to start looking at how your case turned into a scandal uh, the little mm -hmm. steps along the way the uh, chance uh, fortune of certain things happening at certain times and then the overwhelming uh, reaction of people, the shock reaction of people, I think, to finding out that this affected so many more women. And then ultimately that it, that information had been kept from them uh, about failures in their health care. So that's yeah. where we're going to start heading down the road of next time we're talking. And yep. in the meantime, uh, from me, Keen O'Carroll, in conversation with Vicky Phelan, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Keen. Looking forward to the next one. Good. Hi, Vicky and I hope that you've enjoyed that episode and you're finding the series informative. If there's anything else that you'd like us to discuss or touch upon, please mention it in a comment below. And to be informed of future episodes, hit the subscribe button.